ஸ்ரீ குருபியோ நமஹா வி வெல்கம் யூ டு அவர் ஆன்லைன் டீச்சிங் அகாடமி ஏ கலைவா நவ் வி ஆர் கோயிங் டு லேர்ன் அப்ரோஸ் லெசன் ஆஃப் கிளாஸ் லெவன் சிபிஎஸ்இ இங்கிலீஷ் வி ஆர் நாட் அ ஃப்ரை டு டை இஃப் வி கேன் ஆல் பி டுகெதர் ரிட்டன் பை கார்டன் குக் அண்ட் ஆலன் ஈஸ்ட் நவ் லெட் அஸ் நோ அபவுட் த ஆத்தர்ஸ் கார்டன் குக் வாஸ் போர்ன் ஆன் 3 December 1978 in Toronto. He is a two-time Canadian Olympic sailor. He sails for the Royal Canadian Yacht Club. He is a son of Stephen Cook and Linda Cook. He had a great interest in writing stories too. And Alan East was admitted to the role of solicitors in 2003 and has gained extensive experience as a litigator manager and legal trainer. In 2010 Allen joined Conventry University as a senior lecturer in law. In this lesson the narrator describes how optimism, determination and strong will power raise one's spirits and help us overcome all forms of stressful situations. Now we'll move on to the line by line explanation of this lesson. In July 1976 my wife Mary San Jonathan 6 daughter Susan 7 and I set sail from Plymouth England to duplicate the round the world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook for the longest to time Mary and I a 37 year old businessman had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer and for the past 16 years we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters It was in July 1976 the narrator along with his wife Mary San Jonathan and daughter Susan set sail from Plymouth England to sail around the world the son was just 6 years old while the daughter was 7 the narrator was a 37 years old businessman but he dreamt like an explorer He wanted to repeat the performance of Captain James Cook made 200 years earlier. For past uh, 16 years he had been improving his seafaring skills in British water. Here honing our seafaring skills means improving the skills required to travel by sea. Our boat wave walker a 23 meter 30 ton wooden hulled beauty had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find the first leg of our planned 3 year 1 lakh 5000 kilometers journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of africa to cape town there before heading east we took on two crewmen american larry vigil and swiss hub siegler to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas the southern indian ocean they got a ship built professionally a 23 meter 30 ton wooden hulled wooden hulled here is a water tight body of a ship and it was called wave walker they took several months to test in the roughest weathers the initial phase of the three long year journey of 1 lakh 5000 km passed away pleasantly they sailed down the west coast of africa to cape town the narrator hired two crewmen american larry vigil and swiss herb sinclair before heading towards the east to tackle the roughest sea the southern indian ocean On our second day out of Cape Town we began to encounter strong gales for the next few weeks they blew continuously gales did not worry me but the size of the waves was alarming up to 15 meters as i as our main mast december 25 found us 3500 kilometers east of cape town despite atrocious weather we had a wonderful holiday complete with the christmas tree new year's day saw no improvement in the weather but we reason that it had to change soon and it did change for the worse on the second day in cape town 
they encountered a strong gale strong gale means a very strong wind a strong wind was not a problem but 15 meters high waves which were the height of the mast mast here is a tall upright structure on a boat worried the narrator on december 25 they had traveled 3500 kilometers east of cape town despite the bad weather the weather remained the same till new year's day but they hoped for it to change soon the weather conditions worsened at dawn on january 2 the waves were gigantic we were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots as the ship rose to the top of each wave we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us and the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears on the early morning of uh, january 2 the waves were gigantic gigantic here is very huge we were sailing with only a st small storm jib at a speed of 8 knots here st storm jib is uh, a triangular stay sail set forward the mast in a ship and knots here is unit of uh, speed equal to 1 nautical mile per hour when the ship was sailing with the huge waves the, they could see the huge sea in front of them the noise of the waves and strong winds was painful for the yes slow the boat down we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern then we double lashed everything we went through our life raft drill attached lifelines donned oil skins and life jackets and waited here they dropped the storm jib to slow down the ship and lashed a heavy mooring rope here mooring rope is the ropes chains or anchors by or to which a boat ship or buoy is moored they lashed with the heavy mooring rope across the stern stern here is the back part of a ship or a boat then we double lashed everything then and they lashed everything with a double force they donned donned here is put on put on their oil skins and life jackets attached life lines and went through the life raft trails and waited the indication of impending disaster came at about 6 pm with an ominous silence the wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship with horror i realized that it was not a cloud but a wave like no other i had ever seen it appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest the roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment i thought we might ride over it the first indication of uh, impending disaster impending is about to happen came at about 6 pm with an ominous silence ominous silence here and pleasant or threatening silence the wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft aft is here near the stern of the ship later the narrator realized it was a huge wave the wave was perfectly vertical and it was twice the height of the previous waves with a frightful breaking crest crest here is the top of a wave the thunder increased and the wave moved the stern up they thought they might ride over the wave but then a tremendous explosion shook the deck a torrent of green and white water broke over the ship my head smashed into the wheel and i was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves 
I accepted my approaching death and as I was losing consciousness, I felt quite peaceful. Unexpectedly, my head bobbed out of the water. A few meters away, Waywalker was near capsizing, her mast almost horizontal. The thunder increased. They thought that it would not do any damage, but a huge explosion vibrated the deck. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship. Now the narrator's head smashed in the wheel of the ship. Then he flew overboard and sank below the waves. He accepted that his death was approaching and started losing consciousness and he felt quite peaceful. The narrator's head popped out of the water. A few meters away, Waywalker was near capsizing and her mast was almost horizontal. The wave hurled her upright. My lifeline jerked taut. I grabbed the cord rails and sailed through the air into Waywalker's main boat. Subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll. My left ribs cracked, my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. Water, water everywhere. I could feel that the ship had water below. But I dared not abandon the wheel to investigate. Then a huge wave hurled the wave walker upright. The narrator's uh, lifeline uh, Jerk, short, thought as pulled tightly. Then he grabbed the god rails and sailed through the air into Wave Walker's main bow. Subsequent waves tossed him around the deck like a rag doll. His left ribs cracked, his mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow he found the wheel and lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. There was water everywhere. The narrator could feel water below the ship, but he did not leave the wheel alone to investigate. Suddenly, the front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared. We are sinking, she screamed. The decks are smashed. We are full of water. Take the wheel, I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch. Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen. Broken timbers hung at crazy angles. The whole starboard Side bulged inwards. Clothes, crockery, shorts, tins, and toys sloshed about in deep water. I half swam, half crawled into the children's cabin. Are you all all right? I asked. Yes, they answered from an upper bunk. Suddenly, the French door opened, and his wife Mary came screaming that they were sinking. Then the narrator handed heard the wheel and climbed it towards the door. The crewmen, Harry and uh, Herb, were pumping like a madman. The starboard of the ship had sunk. Clothes, crockery, charts and tins were moving around in deep water. Then the narrator swam and crawled to the children's cabin and asked the children whether they were all right. And the children replied, yes. But my head hurts a bit, said Sue, pointing to a big bump over her eyes. I had no time to worry about bumped heads. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, I struggled back on deck. With the starboard side bashed open, we were taking water with each wave that broke over us. If I could not make some repairs, we would surely sink. Somehow I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gapping holes. Some water continued to stream below, but most of it was now being deflected over the side. Sue, his daughter, complained about a big bump on her head. The narrator did not pay much attention to it as his major concern was to save them. The narrator found the screws, hammer and canvas. He went back to the deck. The broken starboard side was letting so much water in. If the narrator could not fix 
the problem, they would all sink in the sea. The narrator stretched the canvas cloth and secured the waterproof hatch which covered the gaping holes. Some water streamed below and some was now deflecting over the side. More problems arose when our hand pump started to block up with the debris floating around the cabins and the electric pump short circuited. The water level rose threateningly. Back on deck, I found that two spare hand pumps that had been drenched overboard along with the four-stay sail, the jeep, the dinghies and the main anchor. Then I remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor. I connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked. And more problems arose when uh, their hand pump started to block up with the debris uh, floating around the cabins and uh, the electric uh, pump short circuited. Then the water level rose uh, threateningly. Back on uh, deck, uh, we found that uh, two spare hand pumps had been drenched overboard, had been removed along with the uh, four stay sail, uh, the jeep and the dinghies. Dinghies here is a small boat for recreation with mast or sail and the main anchor. Then uh, he remembered that he had another electric pump under the chart floor. Then he connected uh, the electric pump uh, to an out pipe and it worked out well. Thank you. We will continue the lesson in the next part.